What an exciting day. I am so stoked that we have been given this new place where we can call home, a new place where we can connect with our neighbors, and I hope you're excited too. Like Emily said, I would love to take you on a tour and show you the space. Go to thepointknox.com to sign up. Uh, I'm really, really looking forward to what this space will allow us to do as we connect our neighbors and connect this community to Jesus. It's going to be great. Now, dads, happy Father's Day. I, I don't know if you've heard this yet today or not, but uh, we love you. And it's great to be a dad. As a new dad who thankfully has a wife who lets me sleep most of the night, though I feel guilty every morning, I have to say, dads, your job is hard. It's difficult to be a dad. It takes a lot of work, and sometimes my kids, they take a lot of a lot of grace, a lot of patience. My kids have shown me, if nothing else, just how sinful I really am. Because the more I try to love them, the more they find ways to make it really difficult. So dad, if you are watching, if you're joining us, and you're having kind of a rough dad week or month or year, and things have been kind of a challenge, hang in there. It's okay. Keep going. God loves you, and so do we. And if you're a dad who's just knocking it out of the park and killing it, please don't post that on Facebook because I will definitely begin to get a little jealous and say, why can't I just be as great as this dad? I'm certainly not. But each one of us knows the value of a dad, especially those of us who didn't have one or don't have one who's involved in our lives. If you're someone who's not had a very good dad, or your dad left a long time ago, or maybe died at a very early age, the pain of being fatherless on Father's Day. It's really real. And I want you to know today, too, we love you. We're here for you. We care about you. Throughout this book that we call the Bible, this book called Holy Scripture, God's Word to Us, he paints a picture of fathers that I think is worth us exploring. All of this book from beginning to end, you can see time and time again the role of the Father as being essential in the life of the community, in the church, in the family, and the role of the Father shapes the future generations for years to come. So we're going to today explore this role of the Father in our Real Men Cry series today, Real Men Cry for Women and Children. And we're going to explore some of what the Bible teaches about the role of the Father and some of the ways in which we screw it up and some of the hope when everything seems lost. Now here goes. Before we get into this word of God, there's a truth about the value of the Father that we know even outside of this word. There's a truth that the world around us is beginning to recognize more and more that the father is immensely important in the life of a child and the future of that child. Consider this reality. A single mother raising a child without a father at home is four times more likely to live in poverty than a child that has both parents at home. If you are a single mother, your job is exponentially harder because there's no dad present. Not only is poverty significantly higher amongst those who have no father in the home, suicide is higher. The likelihood of teenage suicide doubles when there's no dad present. Did you know this? Our culture is beginning to recognize that without a dad, problems happen. But you see, the problems without a dad don't just happen in your home. The lack of a father in your home changes the neighborhood. In fact, there have been many studies that have tried to see what effect does a lack of fatherhood have on a community. And what they found is for proportionately, the proportion of the community, for every 1% decrease in fatherhood or fathers that are present, there's a 3% increase in adolescent crime, teenage crime. So the more the community loses its dads, the more dads aren't present in the life of the community, the more everyone suffers. Not only this, our education system knows that dads are essential. In fact, when dads are involved in the life of education, when they're present in the school and their voices are, are lifted up and raised, they see that GPAs for all students increase. Uh, graduation rates increase when dads are engaged in school. This is 
these are facts proven not by Christians trying to reaffirm what the Bible says, but by just people in this world who've looked and observed and studied and noticed these trends. Dads matter. Throughout scripture, this idea of dads mattering is really clear. In fact, in the Ten Commandments, which you've probably heard of at some point, the fourth commandment is honor your father and mother. And this is the only commandment that has a promise attached to it. When we honor our father and mother, it says, then it will go well with you in the land and you will live long lives. When we as people see the value of parents, mother and father, and we elevate that value to something more than just a placeholder, more than just a breadwinner, more than just putting food on the table or dropping us off at our sporting events. When the mother and father, our parents, are elevated, everything changes. It's this commandment with a promise. And through the whole Old Testament, we see these commands to honor your father and your mother. We see these commands to lift up the father. We see these challenges spoken directly to dads. Dad, teach the faith to your household. Teach them the law of God, the word of God, to walk in truth. Teach them how to live with humility, how to live with meekness and yet a drive and a fierceness that will fight for what's right. Teach them how to live the way God created us to be. And what we see all through the Old Testament is when dads fail to do their job, everybody suffers. When dads fail to do what they've been called to do, the whole community hurts. So let's look at scripture a little bit. Today we're going to look at this man known as a man after God's heart. David, the very man we considered last week. The man that he tore lions and bears apart with his hands. He conquered enemies in battle. He defeated the multitudes. The man who could do it all. And also the man filled with emotions, who was in tune with his pain, who knew his hurt, who wrote songs and played the harp, the man who was in many ways very effeminate and yet very manly. This man after God's own heart. When we look at him as a father, it's kind of disappointing actually. You see, David was a great man and a great king. He was a great songwriter. He was a great leader. He was a great planner. But he wasn't a very good dad. In fact, he often failed his children, and it caused them great pain. This story begins in 2 Samuel chapter 11. You're probably familiar with this story. David, this man of God, this king, in the, the prime of his leadership, when he's supposed to have it all together, sees a woman bathing on the rooftop. And the way the story is written, she's doing what is honorable and right, and he is not. And in that moment, he makes a decision to have an affair with her, to cheat, to sleep with her. And she gets pregnant, and he chooses not to admit his wrong, but to kill her husband to cover it up. Interesting, throughout the whole Bible, Bathsheba is never accused of being an adulterer or a sinful woman. Only David. It shows that in that instance, David was the wrong party, not both. In that instance, David was the one who sinned, who intentionally entered into a relationship that would destroy his family. In fact, right afterwards, it does destroy his family. As a result of that sin, God actually you know, takes the life of his child. Nathan the prophet warns David, your family will struggle and fall apart because of this sin. It won't go well with you. And we see just two chapters later, that unraveling of his family begins. And it begins in a pretty horrendous way. David, he has multiple children, several of them with different women, different wives. And David uh, has these two children specifically, Absalom and Tamar, brother and sister from the same mother. And then he has Amnon, one, a half-brother of them, a son of David, but of a different mother. And Amnon does this terrible thing in 2 Samuel chapter 13. He falls madly in love with Tamar, his half-sister. 
And through a series of trickery and deceit, he catches her uh, alone in his private room and he takes advantage of her and violates her in the worst kind of ways. And then he's filled with hatred and he sends her off. We see that David's family did not honor the same law, the same God that David did. His sins, the sin of adultery and lust, of selfish pride seeking to do what's right for you and abolishing and not caring about anyone else, those sins of David come into his family now. And Absalom will have nothing to do with it. So for two years, Absalom plots how can he get revenge for his sister? How can he make right what has been taken from Tamar? And he seeks a way to kill his half-brother. After two years of plotting and planning, he finally goes out and he kills his half-brother. And then he runs and he flees for three more years in hiding. Meanwhile, what does David, this godly king, this godly man do? Nothing. He doesn't publicly condemn it. He doesn't publicly tell everyone this wasn't okay. He just weeps and mourns and wishes his son would return. And when the opportunity comes later, he invites his son back. He welcomes his son Absalom back on one caveat. You're welcome in my kingdom, but at a distance. You're welcome over there. I don't want you face to face to see me. It hurts too much for you to look at me. I can't do that. But there's no consequence, no punishment, no discipline beyond that. The people take notice. And then the story continues. Absalom, in his rebellion, in his hatred for his father, in his sinfulness, doesn't just go and and kill his half-brother. No, Absalom continues in this downward spiral. And he decides he wants to be the king. He wants to be the one who reigns over everything. He seeks to have a a coup to overthrow his dad. He seeks to take the throne by force. And he does so by spreading rumors and lies and misinformation, telling all the people that he would just be so much better than David is. David hears these rumors. They grow so much. The followers of Absalom grow so much that David actually feels the need to flee from Jerusalem, to run in hiding as king. This is the king who stood up to Goliath as a small shepherd boy. This is the king who conquered Philistines, who defeated enemies in masses. This is the king who led the people to worship God in this great and glorious way. But when faced with inner turmoil, turmoil in his family, a son who's rebellious, who refuses to come back to God, he just runs and hides and ignores the problem at hand. And while he's gone, he leaves several of the women of his household to remain behind and care for his household. And in 2 Samuel 16, Absalom returns to Jerusalem to take the throne, and he enters into the palace, and there's nobody there but these women, these women who were dear to his father, these women who were in his father's household, these women that his father had had children with and slept with. And Absalom does something horrendous that the Bible curses. Absalom actually takes these women and sleeps with them. Again, the sins of the father continue to persist in the next generation. And Absalom, he sleeps with them in an act of defiance, of dishonoring David, of declaring before all the people, this will be my throne and I can do as I please. This is my house and you can't stop. This rebellious child continues to go unchecked. David doesn't really stop him. Even after such a horrendous thing that the law of God says that deserves death. David still wants his son to have everything go well. He wants to excuse all the wrong in his son and just choose to believe all the positive. Until finally in chapter 18, we get to this account. Where one of David's leaders, David's military general says, we need to do something about this rebellious man. He's making a mockery of God. He's making a mockery of you. He's dishonoring this community and destroying the fabric of this community. Something must be done. So David permits them to go off to war. 
to go against this army of rebellious individuals, this army of people <coughs> led by Absalom, this army seeking to destroy what God has built. And they go to war. But David in 2 Samuel chapter 18 reveals his heart for his son. This is what he says in verse 5. He says, uh, Deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. You see, the law required Absalom to be put to death. The law required these transgressions to have a great consequence, but it is David's desire that his son not experience the pain and the hardship and the reality of the consequences for his life. He just wants it to go well for his son. So he asks his commanders, he asks his military leaders in the presence of all the people, please deal gently with my son. Please. And as the story unfolds, they go to war. And the, the people of David's army, they lead the battle into a forest, giving them the upper hand, making it harder for the, the armies of Absalom to fight against them. And it says the forest itself actually kills more people in the battle. The terrain itself is proof that God is on their side because the forest is even working to defend David. And then there's this incredible and weird moment. Absalom is riding on his mule through this forest, a mule commonly an animal ridden by royalty into battle, an animal ridden by those who are kings themselves. He rides into this forest, and in verse 9 it says this, And Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak, and his head caught fast in the oak. And he was suspended between heaven and earth, while the mule that was under him went on. Picture that. I don't know what his hair looked like, if it was a big curly fro or just a long flowing mane, but in some way his hair was up and his hair was out, and this luscious hair on his head got stuck in the trees, and his horse, his mule, just kept on going. What a comical sight to think about, right? A man dangling in a tree because of his hair? This is where being bald would be a really good advantage. But him hanging in the tree is so much more than just an accident. See, in Deuteronomy, the curse of one who sins against his father in these great ways of sleeping with his mother is to be cursed to hang in a tree. To be cursed to die in a tree. Throughout the Old Testament, anyone who hangs in a tree for their death is considered to be cursed by God. And here is this son of royalty, this son of David, whom David has regularly overlooked his wrongdoings, ignored his sinfulness, chosen to look past it because he cared. And now his sign of royalty is gone. He's hanging in a tree, defenseless and vulnerable. Almost this picture for those who come ac ac across him that God himself has left Absalom. And Joab and his men come across him and they, they decide to do exactly opposite of what David wanted. They actually kill Absalom while he's hanging in that tree. And as they kill him hanging in the tree, they take him down then and they hastily bury him in a very crude and dishonoring grave, one that's remnant of the foreigners that were killed in battle in the book of Joshua. Of the, the kings that came against the people of Israel, they were often dishonored in their burial as a sign that God was against them. This is what happens with Absalom. Now, as David is both king and father, he's in this really difficult place. Because his father, his reaction that we will see in just a moment, I think would be my reaction too. As father, his reaction makes a lot of sense. But as a king, his reaction doesn't make any sense at all. So we'll talk about that. Going forward, this is his reaction. Uh, after Absalom dies, after he hangs in the tree and they kill him, they blow the trumpet and they call the whole army, come back, the war's over. This enemy of ours is no more. And they all come back. And then David receives messengers that tell him his son has died. And this is what David cries out in chapter 18, verse 33. The king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. 
And as he went, he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. We see with this repetition and this pain that David is weeping for the brokenness of his family. That his son would die in large part because of his son's sinfulness. He's weeping because the sin of his son has now come to fruition and borne the very fruit it deserved and it demanded. And David's broken. As a dad who's lost two children due to miscarriage, there's a part of me that can join in David's weeping. The pain of losing a child I imagine at any age never gets easier. I imagine there's no level of sinfulness my kids can commit, things they can do at which I would not feel sorrow when they die. And yet, David is rebuked for his pain. You see, the sorrow that he has for his son reveals that his priorities were backwards. His priorities as a father were not for his children to walk with God, not for his children to honor God. His priorities were not for God to be elevated and made known. His priorities as a father were to just see his children do well. And I think for many of us, that's a really natural priority to have. I just want my kids to succeed. I just want them to be happy. I want them to have a better life than I had. Have you ever said these things or wanted them? I certainly want all of those things for my kids. I want their life to be way better than mine. But if I make their quality of life more important than the quality of their relationship with God, I've missed the point. Because no quality of life, nothing I can give them, will ever last if they don't have that relationship with God. If they don't know his will and walk in his ways, if they don't trust in his love and seek after his promises, if they miss that, nothing I do matters. And so in chapter 19, has David's weeping publicly for all to see, as he's revealing that his priorities were misfocused and misguided, Joab, the very general who disobeyed him and killed Absalom, Joab rebukes David. And he says this, And the people stole into the city that day as people steal in who are ashamed when they flee in battle. The king covered his face, and the king cried with a loud voice, O oh, my son Absalom, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Then Joab came into the house to the king and said, You have today covered with shame the faces of all your servants who have this day saved your life and the lives of your sons and your daughters and the lives of your wives and your concubines, because you love those who hate you and you hate those who love you. For you have made it clear today that commanders and servants are nothing to you. For today I know that if, Abs if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead today, then you would be pleased. Joab calls out David's wrong priorities. He said, look at all these people who faithfully followed you, who trusted you, who would give their life for you. Look at all of these people who would honor God by honoring you. And you would rather dishonor all of them because of your son. And David, interestingly enough, doesn't reply to Joab at all. He doesn't in the slightest bit tell Joab off or say, stop saying such things, my son is dead. He doesn't even in the slightest bit say, you're wrong. He wipes away his tears and he gathers the people and he repents. And he says, today should be a day of celebrating for God has delivered us from the hands of our enemy. Can you imagine that turmoil going on within David? Realizing his priorities were misfocused, his priorities were wrong, and though he felt that pain of a son who was dead, he had a responsibility to the people around him to remind them and encourage them that their honoring of God and risking their life was truly noble and valuable in every way. See, men, today I want to challenge you in this. Being a dad is really hard. 
Our natural inclination is to be for our children in a way that is sometimes really unhealthy. We want to give them things or do things for them that are not ours to give and not ours to do. We want to see them thrive in ways we can't guarantee. And oftentimes, as a dad, I find myself guilty of one of two things. Either placing my priorities in the wrong things for my kids or in the wrong things for myself. See, the truth is, as a dad, I have a responsibility to give everything in me to teach my kids who God is and what he's done how he expects us to live in accordance with his grace, what he wants from his people and his children. I have a responsibility to lead my kids to know, love, and trust in Jesus. And yet oftentimes in my selfishness, I pursue what seems right to me. In the moment, what feels good to me, I dismiss their cries for attention or their cries for energy from me because I'm tired and I'm worn out and I just want it to be about me. Dads, you have a really hard job. Doing the work that God has called you to do to be a dad will take everything from you. It will require everything in you to raise your children to know God, even when that means saying no to really good things. To raise your children to walk with Jesus, even when that means disciplining them when you don't want to. And you'd rather just let it slide and let it go by. And you have a responsibility to care. To see not only that they walk with God, but the world around them is shaped to walk with God by their life. You see, if David did not rebuke here, if he had just continued to go on in his grief and his pain as if his son was in the right, all of these others would have been led astray to believe that they couldn't follow God they couldn't follow David, this man God had promised to bring forth the Messiah. As is typically the case in the whole Old Testament, these stories of the Old Testament point us forward to that of the new, to that of Jesus who would come for us. Interestingly enough, just as Absalom hung in a tree, cursed by God, stripped of his royalty, so too Jesus hung on a tree. Son of David, cursed by God, stripped of his royalty. See, Jesus came into this world not as a meek and mild one to love, but as a righteous king to come and lay everything down that we, his children, God's children, can get our priorities right, can be set straight, can walk with him, knowing him, trusting him, loving him. Through us, the world can take note. And when Jesus gave everything up for our sin, he gave us a new way of living and a new way of being dad. You see, your past as a dad does not have to define you. Your past as a father, the ways you failed before, do not have to continue to define the ways you fail again. But Jesus can change everything. And maybe you're listening going, this is all good and great, but I have no kids. We tried and we failed. We tried and we couldn't have kids. We've lost our kids. Our kids are already long gone. I'm still single. I wish I had kids. What does this all mean for me? Well, here's the beautiful thing about scripture. Being a dad is really just being a man. Being a man who honors God. And you and I, with kids or without, with kids who love Jesus or don't, you and I today can be the kind of man every dad needs to be. And we can look for those children around us who need a dad in their life. We can look for those kids, the 23% of single mothers in this country. The 23% the of all children who grow up without a dad at home. We can look for those kids and become like a dad to them. Paul, in, in fact, he goes on later, he, he talks about Timothy and how he became like a dad to Timothy. Like a father to this one whom he treated and believed to be his son. See, if you have kids or you don't, there's a really great truth in scripture. That real men invest in the lives of children. And you can do that with big brothers, big sisters. 
You can do that with your neighborhood school. You can do that with your nephews, with your kids. You can invest your energy and your time in the lives of kids so that they know a God who loves them. We have all kinds of pain and turmoil in this world. Sinfulness that seems rampant and people who are falling apart desperate to cling to something. I believe, men, when we begin to cry for children, to stand up for what's right, to begin to say we will give our time and our energy and our efforts, we will give our love, we will give our finances, we will give everything we have to invest in children. We will see a change in the generations to come. Just like David, when we fail and we have our priorities wrong, we need to be called out. It says in scripture that as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. We as men need to have other men in our lives who can look us in the eye and say, you have missed the point. Come back to Jesus. It's all about him. And let's together figure out now what? And women, if you're watching and listening, saying, I, I love all of this, but that's not my husband. Like You have a really important job to do. Your job is not to convince your husband to suck less. Uh -huh. Trust me, you probably won't succeed. Your job is not to tell him all the ways he fails and all the ways you wish he did it right. Your job to help men be the kind of men who cry for children is to show them the value of children. And you do so by showing them the value that you see in these men. By holding them accountable and saying, I believe you are more than just sitting on the TV and watching sports all day long. Let me help you find it. Encourage this man you love who's not the father you want him to be. Encourage him to spend time with godly men who can help shape him into a new kind of man. Encourage him to take time to seek God whatever that looks like. Most of all, pray for him. Pray that he would begin to step into that really difficult and really challenging role, that role of being the kind of man, the kind of dad who cares about children, both his and those that are not his. When we as the church believe that men need to cry for children, and we begin to live in such a way that puts our priorities not on the well-being and peacefulness of our children, but on our children knowing Jesus. It will change everything. And when we fail, and we get it wrong, we come back to the cursed son of David who hung on the tree. And we say, once again, I cannot do this. Help me. Forgive me. Renew me. And lead me to walk in your ways. Amen. Will you join me in prayer? God, we thank you that your word is enough. And your word paints this picture that fathers are incredibly important to our community. God, help us to be dads who care more about our children walking with you than getting a college scholarship. Help us be dads who care more about our children knowing the fullness of life you offer than about our children experiencing the fullness of life we can create. Help us to be dads who are present, who weep over children who have no fathers. Help us to step up as men, to reach out to those kids, to those moms who have no dad present, to be there for them as a father, to care and to love, to nurture in faith. And help us, God, above all else, to see your son who would die, that we can know you, the good father, the perfect and righteous Father who will always be there for us, never forsake us, and never leave us. Thank you, God, for the role of dads. Thank you for the dads in our life who are good and godly, and thank you for the ones who are not. Help us to encourage and strengthen and support all dads to walk with you, to trust you, to love you, and to share you with others pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue our worship now, we are going to collect an offering. And we collect an offering during this time apart uh, by giving online at thepointknox.com. You can click the little blue giving button in the bottom corner. You can give uh, with the, our P.O. box or through a Regions Bank drive-thru. However you choose to give, know this. 
Everything the point does is to connect the disconnected. And from the beginning, 10 years ago, our focus was how do we reach men who are disconnected from God? Because the truth is, if we can reach men and connect with men and help them become godly men and godly dads who cry for their children, the truth is we will connect women too. And so everything we do is about raising up and encouraging men to stand up and say, you can be the man God called you to be. Will you join us in this? Your offering helps us to connect the disconnected and to continue to do what we're doing. However you choose to give or whatever you choose to give, remember this. We don't give to get God's love, but because we already have it. Thank you.